Welcome, everyone. My name is Ashley Stevenson, and I'm a medical student at Stanford University School of Medicine. In this video, we will go over the science of COVID-19, how it affects the body, how it spreads, and what we can do to prevent spread. Maybe you feel like you know a lot about COVID-19 or nothing at all. No matter where you're starting from, that's completely okay. Joining me in this series is Dr. Jennifer Newberry. Welcome, Dr. Newberry. Thank you, Ashley, for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Newberry, an emergency physician at Stanford University. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, before we get started, we have a couple important disclaimers. While we will talk a lot about COVID, this video series should not be used for personal medical advice. If you're worried about your own health, please talk to your doctor, who knows you and your medical needs best. We may also talk about legal issues that have come up during the pandemic. Our aim will be to make you aware of these, but once again, you should talk to a lawyer if you have any legal concerns of your own. Another important point to mention is how new COVID-19 is from a science perspective. I know it feels like we've been dealing with it for so long, but we are still learning a lot about the disease. The information in these videos is the most up-to-date to our knowledge, but keep in mind that good science is always evolving, so we will keep learning more. Yes, that is a great point. And the last final note, none of us has any financial conflicts of interest to declare, which means we're not making any money on this. Okay, with that, let's get started. Tell us, Dr. Newberry, what will we be learning about today? Today, we're going to talk about the virus SARS-CoV-2 and how it affects the human body, including the symptoms it causes in the incubation period for COVID-19. That is, how long it takes for the virus to build up in the body and cause symptoms. Excellent. Okay, I have a question for you to kick things off. What's the difference between COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2? Great question. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of a specific virus. COVID-19 is the disease caused by this virus. You'll hear us using both terms, depending on whether we're talking about the virus or the illness. We know this can be confusing, and when we hear these two terms in the news, they are often used to mean the same thing. But we think it's helpful to understand the difference, because it will be important when we start talking about vaccines. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what this virus actually is, and why we care. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to a family of viruses called coronaviruses. Within this family, there are lots of different types of coronaviruses, and they all affect us slightly differently. One way to think about families of viruses is to think about different breeds of dogs. A chihuahua and a beagle and a shih tzu all have different personalities, but all three are clearly recognizable as dogs. It's the same thing with coronaviruses. Yes, that's a great way to think about it. And just like some dogs are friendlier than others, not every coronavirus will make you super sick. One type of coronavirus, for example, just causes the common cold. We have known about that virus for decades, and we aren't worried about it. It doesn't cause us much harm. On the other hand, you probably have also heard of the SARS outbreak years ago. That's an example of a dangerous coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately, is much more like that one. Okay, so if we've known about the first SARS for years, why is SARS-CoV-2 causing us so much more trouble? Yes, it's frustrating, right? Just like the dog breeds we talked about, these two coronaviruses are slightly different. So while we do know a lot about its sibling, SARS-CoV-2 has had some surprises in store for us. It picked up some mutations that let it jump from person to person more easily, for instance. Okay, next, how do we get infected with SARS-CoV-2? This virus gets into the air when people who are already infected with it breathe, talk, cough, or sneeze. If we are near those people, we may then breathe the virus in through our mouth or nose and become sick ourselves. This particular virus is light, and so it can also hang around in droplets in the air for a while. That unfortunately makes it easy to catch in closed indoor spaces when the air is not regularly filtered. And what about surfaces? Do we need to worry about getting sick from touching those? That's a little more complicated. Looking at the research, the risk of catching COVID from touching an object with virus particles on it seems to be fairly low. This is because the virus will die if it's sitting outside of the human body for too long. 
but we still do want to be careful. There's always some risk. Okay. So now the virus has found its way into the body. What happens next? Well, every virus has a particular receptor that it likes most. You can think about this like a lock and key. Each virus has a key, but it also has to find its unique lock. In the body, these locks are proteins that we call receptors. And SARS-CoV-2 is tricky because the receptor or lock that it uses is found in lots of different places in the body, right? Yes, exactly. This is important when we're trying to understand why SARS-CoV-2 can make us so sick. It also explains a lot of the different symptoms of COVID-19. And speaking of that, why don't you tell us what symptoms SARS-CoV-2 can cause? Absolutely. Well, it's primarily a respiratory virus. So one of the main symptoms of COVID-19 is a really bad cough. It also likes the lungs rather than the nose. So we don't tend to see congestion as a primary feature like we do with colds. Yes, that's true. Many people won't have a runny or stuffy nose, which can help us know whether we have a typical cold versus whether we have COVID-19. Although this isn't 100% perfect, of course. So it's important to still consider COVID even if you do have congestion. There are also some other symptoms to be aware of. The virus can cause body aches, fatigue, headaches, and a fever. Some people get diarrhea and experience nausea or vomiting. And let's not forget one of the strangest symptoms of COVID-19. Can you tell us about that one, Dr. Newberry? One of the hallmarks of COVID-19 is that it can cause our sense of smell and taste to change. For some people, things may taste or smell unpleasant. Other people might lose their sense of smell and taste altogether. This has to do with those receptors we talked about before. Some of the receptors that SARS-CoV-2 attaches to are on cells that help us to detect smell and taste coming from our nose and tongue. People who experience the system may report a really strange sensation where they can sense the texture of food and liquid without knowing what it smells or tastes like. This symptom is a particularly important one to watch out for. Um, do people get their sense of smell and taste back when they recover? I really like to enjoy my food. Good question. Yes. Fortunately, most people who recover from COVID-19 do eventually get to taste their food again, although it might take a few weeks or even months. Before we move on, I want to emphasize that COVID-19 can look a little different in every person. So even two people in the same family might experience totally different symptoms. One person might get a cough and lose their sense of smell, whereas the other person might become really ill, struggle to breathe, and even have to be hospitalized. Very good point. And because of that, we shouldn't rule out COVID-19 just because our symptoms are different from the ones our sister or our best friend had when they got sick. Okay, now that we understand what symptoms to look for, let's talk about when they will show up and how long they will last for. We'll look at an example on this calendar so everyone can follow along easily. Let's pretend someone, we'll call her Rosita, wakes up with COVID-19 symptoms. The exact day that symptoms will appear after infection varies a little bit, but on average, they seem to occur around day four after infection. So looking at the calendar, we can see that Rosita probably became infected about four days before she felt sick. Why is this important for us to know, Ashley? We need to know when Rosita first became infected in order to figure out where she was likely exposed to the virus and who else might be at risk of getting sick. It's also important for another reason. In those first three to four days, Rosita didn't know that she was sick, and yet the virus was in her body, which means that she could have infected anyone else she saw during those days without realizing it. Exactly. And knowing about these things is crucial for understanding how we can limit the virus from spreading. So next question. Why did the virus take a few days to show up? Why wouldn't Rosita feel any symptoms on the very first day she breathed in the virus? Just like it takes us time to set up a new home when we move, the virus also has to make its home in the body. First, the virus has to find the protein receptors it needs, those locks we talked about, so that it can enter into our cells. Once it gets into the cells, then it starts to replicate and make lots more virus. Right. At first, there's only a little bit of virus in the body. That also means it's easy for the virus to hide from our immune system. 
But as the virus builds up and makes more and more of itself, our immune system also figures out that there's an invader that doesn't belong. And why is that important, Ashley? Because the immune system does not like invaders. So that's when it starts to fight the virus to try to protect the body. And the defense mechanisms that it uses can actually cause some of the symptoms that we experience, like a fever. And it's this combination of these two things that makes us feel sick. One, the virus building up in our cells until there's so much virus that it finally causes damage to our cells. And two, our immune system itself trying to fight the virus. This is why we feel tired and achy, why we start to have a cough or even get a fever. These are all signs of the fight going on in our body between the virus and our immune system. And the period of time between when the virus first enters our body and when we start showing symptoms is called the incubation period. That is, it takes time for the virus to incubate or build up in the body. A few days, as it turns out, as we can see here. This is why Rosita doesn't wake up feeling sick until about day four. But remember, she can still spread the virus to other people even in those first few days before she starts feeling sick. Okay, Dr. Newberry, what happens next? How long is Rosita going to feel sick for? It varies a lot. Most people recover in about one to two weeks, but they can feel pretty awful during that time. If Rosita is lucky enough to have only a mild case, she should feel better by about day 14. Unfortunately, one of the worst things about COVID-19 is that it can cause something called long hauler syndrome, or sometimes just called long COVID. This is when people who get COVID continue to experience certain symptoms for months. Uh, yes, I've known a few people with that, and it's pretty awful. From what we know so far, which symptoms would you say tend to last the longest? From what we're seeing, fatigue, headaches, and shortness of breath are the most common. Some of our patients say they still feel tired three months later or struggle to climb up a set of stairs without stopping and get daily headaches. In more severe cases, we see lasting damage to other organs, which can have permanent effects on someone's life. For example, they might need to carry around an oxygen tank just to help them breathe. Okay, well, for now, let's hope Rosita improves in the expected two weeks. Next question. How long will Rosita be contagious for? This is really important to understand. Rosita will be contagious for about 10 days after she gets symptoms. That's about the time period it takes for the immune system to destroy enough of the virus. A small group of people might continue to be contagious for about 14 days, but most people should clear it after about 10 days. That's also why we ask people to stay home and away from other people, what we call self-isolation, for at least 10 days. Perfect. We can see the period of time Rosita will need to stay home for. All right. There's one more situation we need to cover. You've heard about asymptomatic spread, right? Can you explain what this means? Yeah, I'll try. You've likely heard a lot about asymptomatic transmission. This is when people catch the virus and pass it on to other people without ever knowing they are sick. That is, they don't experience any symptoms, or they're asymptomatic. And this is actually significant. In fact, some scientists estimate it could be responsible for more than half the cases of COVID-19. That's a whole lot when you consider how many total cases of COVID there are worldwide. And we don't really know why some people never get symptoms. But the why doesn't really matter for our purposes. Again, what we do care about is that even without symptoms ourselves, we can still spread the virus to other people. So just to be clear, what I'm hearing is that you can be infected with the virus, not even know it, and still be contagious. That really complicates things. It really does. But this is why if someone is exposed to a person who possibly has COVID-19, we ask them to self-quarantine for 10 days still even if they don't have any symptoms themselves. They might not feel sick right away, or they might never feel sick at all. There's no certain way of knowing, so we have to be extra safe. I'll also add that we have to consider the effect of the symptoms. When you cough, you spew out a lot more droplets and virus particles than when you're just breathing quietly. This is actually part of the virus's survival strategy, because it, of course, would love to spread to other people which is why we wear masks, right? Yes, exactly. 
So people who feel sick are more likely to send the virus particles out into the world because they have those symptoms, like a cough, for example. Masks can catch and absorb most of the droplets, which is how they work. But the bottom line here is we can still spread the virus just by simply breathing and talking, which is why it's so important to keep taking basic precautions like social distancing and wearing masks. Asymptomatic transmission does happen, and so even people who don't feel sick have to be careful. Okay, let's wrap up by quickly reviewing what we've learned in this video. Today, we learned that SARS-CoV-2 is the specific respiratory virus that causes the disease COVID-19, and that the virus typically takes a few days to show up in the body. We also learned about the range of symptoms COVID-19 can cause, such as a cough, body aches, fatigue, headaches, fever, loss of taste and smell, and many more. We discussed how the virus primarily spreads when people who are infected breathe, talk, cough, or sneeze. Lastly, we emphasize that you can spread the virus even without symptoms, which is why we care so much about things like masks, social distancing, and hand washing. So much good information. Thank you all for taking the time to learn with us. Goodbye for now.